Good evening. Welcome to Diversity TV, season six. I'm your host, Mark Harris, and I'll introduce our tonight's guest uh, shortly. If you're new to Diversity TV, welcome. Glad to have you. If you're a part of our growing legion of fans, welcome back. Uh, tonight we'll be looking at a Native na Nation perspective, uh, so let's get right to it. Diversity TV's mission is to illuminate everyday diversity issues and give the mic and the camera to those who don't always get it. And to that end, uh, we use kind of like the generic de uh, definition of diversity and our seasons follow um, the LCC term. So this is the sixth season that we've been doing this. Uh, because we're on Turtle Island, we always start with a native perspective. Uh, and then because uh, this year uh, we shot some footage and because of the historic events occurring, next week's show will be the footage that we shot when uh, pres then uh, candidate Obama appeared at Matt Court and the, this will appear and run the day after uh, the inaugural. Uh, so of course we have to do an Obama show. Uh, then we'll have an Anglo perspective the next week after that then Africans in America to kick off the first week of uh, Black History Month, Latinos uh, the next week after that, Asian, G gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered, queer, questioning, intersex, two-spirit perspective, uh, March 4th youth, uh, March 11th class, and uh, March 17th just before our spring break, spirituality and religion. Uh, I referenced uh, the t Turtle Island, which is the traditional, uh, the English rendering of the of Tulipit Wapakisinep, which translates uh, into English as the long reaching land, uh, which refers to what is referred to in English as North, Central, and South America. So one land, many nations, no borders. And so when we look at uh, that native nation perspective, one land to many nations, and then we also look at a different view of history. Time actually occurred and was running before 1492, not like we were educated to believe, when on October 12th, uh, basically Taino first contact occurred with uh, a particular Spanish explorer, uh, or actually employee of this in the Spanish government, uh, Cristobal Colon. So when this slide is talking about the Taino meeting Colon at Guanahani Island, that's basically talking from the native perspective. The Taino nation, mm -hmm. its name is usually left out of the history books, and the name of the island, which the Spanish referred to as San Cristobal, or San Salvador Island, well, what was the name of it in the native language of the people that had been living there for thousands of years? That's a race from the history. So Guanahani Island is that. So the, the island that he named Hispaniola. And so when we talk about first contact at Guanahani, the Taino nation makes first contact with Cristobal Colon, an Italian sailor employed by the Spanish government. And then the process called colonization ensues. And colonization requires the destruction of indig indigenous people and their reconstruction in the image of Western civilization. And this requires basically a certain form of education and a certain form of sovereignty, which I would characterize as Trojan horses. That is, weapons disguised as gifts. So sovereignty, you know, with a native nation, you are the same legal status as Germany, but dependent on us, that is the US. And so when we have this graphic, a Trojan horse, weapon disguised as a gift, to use the gift, you first have to understand that it is a weapon and diffuse it, understand how the weapon works, and be able to break it down, which we're going to attempt to do tonight. 
Now, the traditional canon, as we call it in ethnic studies of Western civilization, Columbus discovered America, slavery improved black people, Christianity improved pagans, you know, the white man's burden, you know, to civilize the non-white peoples of the world, bringing them civilization and Christianity and capitalism, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, to counter Trojan horses, you need a Nubian horse. That is a horse trained to battle, uh, Trojan horses. And the spirit of a person disciplines their mind and like a horse is trained to accept a bridle and saddle. So the spirit of a maroon, which is a Taino word, which refers to a native African genetic and cultural hybrid. So African people were at Troy, so we understand Trojan horses, and so hence that analysis, uh, which was brought to us by a native elder who talked about three tests brought to Indian people. And he talked about the Bible, the bottle, and the casino. So native people did have spirituality before Christianity. Mm -hmm. they, some of us did have alcohol technology. Some of us did have gambling. Uh, but the goal of colonization was to break apart the Indian world. In other words, to quote, kill the Indian in the Indian and make him white, or kill the Indian and make him and preserve the man. Uh, basically, uh, this was a white man basically talking about the purpose of Indian boarding schools. So those Trojan horses, weapons disguised as gifts, which broke apart our world, and other factors that broke apart our world, and we're going to try and put that world back together. So our guest tonight is a member of a federally recognized Native nation who works as an education specialist for a confederation of tribes, Nick Sixkiller of the Cherokee Nation, a host of Indian Time Radio on KRVM, and staff of the Confederated Tribe of Siletz Indians. Welcome, Nick. Thank you, Mark. And uh, you really don't need me here tonight. Uh, you're doing a great job. I could listen to you talk for hours. Hey, <laughs> but no, it ain't about me. Yeah, but, uh, you I, are I don't want to do that. I just had to do setup. <laughs> but you're a good host and very intelligent. And it's uh, nice to be here. Well, I felt I had to, like, you know, uh, basically uh, reciprocate. You know, since you uh, helped us with the longhouse benefit mm -hmm. when James and I came and talked about mm -hmm. the Purifé benefit. Um, so let, let's get into our, our little conversation. So what does it mean to you to be Cherokee? What does it mean to me to be Cherokee? Well, it's an honor, of course, to be a part of an indigenous tribe of Turtle Island. Uh, I, I uh, give my thanks to the Creator every day for that. But more than that, uh, since the Cherokee people were originally on the East Coast, uh, Georgia, North Carolina, and were forcibly removed in late 1820s, 1830s to a, a place in the Midwest called Oklahoma or Southeast pretty much. Um, for me to survive, my ancestors traveled on the Trail of Tears and to make it to Oklahoma and be able to have families and eventually my family, my mother, father, and myself came along. Uh, I think, it, to me, uh, the, the survival of the people on the Trail of Tears and to make it to Oklahoma and set up a new Cherokee Nation, which is still there, and I am an enrolled member of the Cherokee tribe of Oklahoma. Uh, I think that's more important to me, to be a survivor, and uh, my ancestors survived through that with the loss of uh, several thousand Cherokees on the way from Georgia to um, uh, Oklahoma. Uh, to me, that is an honor to be a part of that family yeah. that, that survived. Yeah. Uh, and again, to be an American Indian, it means a lot to me. Uh, I'm a multicultural person, so my father was from, uh, uh, well, his father was from the Netherlands, but uh, being a Dutch person, and my mom is Cherokee Irish. Mm. And so I'm a prox, you know, I'm a mixed breed, of course, but mm -hmm. uh, I live my life in the native community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a very important uh, to me to be an indigenous person and uh, to work with, within the native community and uh, to work with the Siletz tribe as an education specialist and uh, I work with them from, um, for maybe for lack of better words, from uh, 
birth to, to death. Yeah. And so anytime in that womb to the tomb, there right? you go, yeah. Uh, yeah. the cradle to casket. Yeah. Uh, so it's an honor for me to work with the people and to educate our people uh, as much as I can. I say our people. I've worked with the Sluts Tribe for going on 14 years, and uh, most of the people in the Sluts think I'm a Sluts Tribal member. <laughs> <laughs> So I get confused about that a lot, but yeah. uh, uh, but it is an honor to, since I'm so far away from my tribe back in Oklahoma, it's, an, it's, it's a privilege for me to work with the Sleds people on an education basis. They had, uh, did they have their own kind of trail of tears? Because I know, um, w what are the, what is a confederation? Well, the confederated tribes of Siletz and uh, most of the tribes in Oregon, or there's nine federally recognized tribes, mm -hmm. and most of uh, the tribes in Oregon are confederated. And what confederated means is, a, uh, or I guess the, uh, the government put that on us is, is to uh, bring many tribes together and put them on one reservation. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some the, of them were enemies. At right, the, yeah. yeah. That, uh, you know, back in the day, that must have been a hardship. Yeah. With Siletz, uh, most of the people are from the uh, Rogue Valley, hmm. and, and they, they gathered people in the 1850s all the way from Northern California uh, to what is now Washington, the border of Washington along the Pacific uh, uh, Ocean, along the, uh, the west side of the Cascades, and put them on a reservation that is now located in Salettes. However, in the 1850s, uh, it, it, and I don't want to get too many facts wrong, so I'm not going to go too well, deep I mean, into the, it. But the, some people are hearing this history for the first time. Right. Because this isn't taught in schools most of the exactly. time. Exactly. Uh, yeah. The reservation, the, uh, they deeded all their lands, all these tribes. There's 27 bands, 27 okay. tribes that make up the Siletz Indian tribe. Okay. Uh, their reservation was originally, after they ceded their land, was all the way from the Silicus Inlet uh, down by Florence, all the way up uh, the, uh, to Lincoln City. What? Yes, and 1.8 million acres, um, approximately, and uh, and most of it was illegally taken away. Uh, the, the reservation now is uh, is a small reservation in the town of Salets, hmm. and uh, actually uh, the casino in Lincoln City uh, was uh, uh, part of the uh, the reservation prior to. Uh, the tribe being disbanded in the 1950s okay. and uh, worked a trade, land trade with the, the governor at that time. And uh, so the Lincoln City uh, Casino is actually on uh, reservation land now. Hmm. So, okay. Yeah. So it was a, a, a big land holding at the time that the, all the people were moved up from the Rogue Valley and, and down that area. Hmm. Uh, but uh, now it's just a small acreage in, in Salettes. Uh, I, I hate to be misquoted on this, I can't remember exactly, but I think it's around 4,000 acres of, of, okay. of tribal land right well, now. Well, that makes sense, yeah. actually. Yeah. So. But, you know, I mean, but still, 4,000 yeah. acres right. from an area that stretches from Florence to Lincoln City originally, right. like continuously yeah. with no break. Right, that was the original reservation, and they gave that to them because uh, at the time there wasn't any roads, there were just game trails right. and, and Indian trails. And, and uh, no sense of resources for the, uh, the so-called dominant society at the time. Yeah. And, and, and so they just they gave them all that land for reservation thinking it was worthless until they recognized the, how valuable the, the inlets were, the bays, the timber, and then, of course, the, uh, the trappers uh, coming down on the, by ship and, and seeing how viable these places were. And so they started moving in, and, of course, they lost the land <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, because it, it was more valuable to the non-Indian than it was the Indian, they thought. And so they well, illegally from that framework, you know, exactly, well, yeah. you're not using you're it. You're not using this. Yeah. Famous quote from John Wayne, yeah. how do you feel about, uh, about the Indians losing all their land? They said, well, it's too much for them to use anyway, so uh -huh. we might as well take right. it. Yeah. yeah, sure, okay. <laughs> the Duke. <laughs> the Duke. So, Mary yeah. and Michael Morrissey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, but anyway, and then the, most of the tribes are uh, confederated, and confederated means just several tr uh, tribes living on one reservation as an Indian tribe, like the Grand Ronde tribes are made of five tribes. Uh, the Sluts, of course, is 27. Um, the Warm Springs is uh, the two, uh, Wasco and um, Brain Dead right now, but, mm -hmm. but uh, most yeah. of the tribes are uh, confederated yeah. in Oregon. Yeah, so basically the, the basic model is 
I guess there's no gentle way of saying it, so why should I be gentle, mm -hmm. right? Force marching people, you know, Correct. I mean, so it's kind of like Trail of Tears all over, and exactly. that's why I was trying yeah. to say, you know, Oregon had its Trail of Tears. Mm -hmm. So where you force march people in the dead of winter, they're sick, you know, they've got the flu, they've got colds, and some of them die on the way. Right, Oh, exactly. too bad, and so, you know, where even though Oregon was, you know, supposed to be a non-slave state, they use Indian slave labor to like build towns mm -hmm. like yachts, among other things, right? right? And so people were forced march from as far away as Northern California, and then you put 27 different native nations together, and boom, that's a confederation. Oh, put five, you know, together here, mm -hmm. that's Grand Ron. Right. Um, so, you know, when you talk about your own bloodlines, um, mm -hmm. not so much the, on the Dutch side, but on, on the Irish side, when we talk about, you know, uh, the, the genocides that happened, one in England, and then the discrimination they found, you know, when they were shipped as slaves to the West Indies, et cetera. Mm -hmm. There's a whole other <laughs> trail of tears on that side that isn't necessarily talked about, right. where mm -hmm. when, I guess the question I want to get to, so if you're, ra were you raised Cherokee, and if not, why not, and how did you come to a realization of it? Well, that is a good question. Uh, I was uh, not raised uh, completely in the Cherokee traditions. Uh, they, they've, uh, of course, know, as you know, they're one of the five civilized tribes. They, they call so called, them, yes, yeah, still yes. called civilized. Yeah. That, uh, they they were moved to Oklahoma and then became uh, lots of, uh, I, I guess, what would you call maybe uh, missionaries? Mm -hmm. uh, would came to all the tribes of, uh, down there and then uh, again tried to uh, make us non-pagan. <laughs> right, learn the right. ways of the, the Christianity from the from from the um, Anglo societies, mm -hmm. and and so uh, I didn't wasn't so much taught our traditions and ways of. of uh, my family is from a little town called Westville, Oklahoma, okay. and um, uh, so I wouldn't wouldn't learn the old ways that uh, my, maybe my mother was brought up in, but but I, they always let me know who I was. They never let me forget. Who I was, and my, I got to thank my dad for that, who passed away back in the 70s. But, but he never let us forget who we were, even though he was non-Indian. He, mm -hmm. he thought you've got, you got uh, something that uh, not everybody has. You got yeah. uh, indigenous blood running through and your you veins. And you can be proud of it. And very proud. He yeah. made us feel proud. And yeah. even though in school, if, if uh, we were uh, asked to be quiet in school, you know. But um, I guess I'm getting off your question. Well, a actually, bit, no, because yeah. that's part of the education, right? Right. So, and even if you bring that to school, you know, if Cherokees or Native people are even mentioned in mm -hmm. the curriculum, most of the time they're not. Right. Uh, how are they portrayed? And so you're mm -hmm. getting this pride at home that when you come to school, that isn't being reflected. Exactly, yeah. and uh, we were kind of not directly to, to keep quiet about it, but just keep it to yourself. And, mm -hmm. and it was a difference. You, uh, you let the educators in school know that you're an Indian or, or, or part Indian or, or American Indian or Native American, like they call us, uh, or even worse than that, if yeah, <laughs> you want right. to get into that. Uh, you knew everything there was to the, about riding a horse and making arrows and shooting <laughs> a bone arrow. And Ooh, exactly, right, all yeah. the stereotypes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, at then, uh, that young age, uh, it was hard to stand up and defend yourself in those days, um, but uh, as time goes on now, I'm teaching my kids that come through the education program through Celets. They don't have to sit there and take the stereotypes. You know, they need to stand up and say something to protect themselves and be proud of who they are. And and so, uh, my dad and mom always let us know who we were, and so I'm very proud of that fact that uh, we always have had our identity mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and she she raised us uh, in the in the feeling that we were first American Indian and then other cultures but never 
turn your back on your other cultures either. So I'm proud of we I, we celebrate St. Patrick's Day, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we grow tulips. Yes. <laughs> I don't mean to be stereotypical. And you eat yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't mean to be stereotypical with that uh, that comment. However, that is a, a sense of pride for me too. Well, you know, part of that home. sense of pride is you know yeah. a sense of humor too, because yeah. you know it's kind of like there's a motif in the blues. Mm. Laughing to keep from crying. <laughs> there you, you know, go. Exactly. Where we'll, we'll just turn it on its head, coyote yeah. way. You know? yeah. You yeah. Use that that trickster piece, um, and I think you raise an important point in point about uh, okay, part of your upbringing, your home training, as it were, was you know a certain pride that was also inclusive, that was also inclusive of all parts of your heritage, not to the exclusion. Right. Uh, of one over the other. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it is an important piece in terms of looking at you know, what we do as educators to teach people, uh, one, that to instill that pride at home and so that when you carry that into the school, then you're able to successfully defend against uh, you know, the question that Nick had asked before, you know, what did I mean by weaponized education? Well, <laughs> mm -hmm. the Columbus discovered America and you know, uh, that type of education. History begins at 1492 or nothing happens before the year zero right. in the calendar that has us, you know, believing that this is 2009, mm -hmm. you know. So, right, nothing happened here, right, <laughs> of any importance. But, you know, the Tainu people are the ones that gave us hurricane, barbecue, hammock, canoe, iguana. But we never hear about who they are. It's like, exactly. oh, it's Columbus? Yeah. Well, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. you know, so you know, when we talk about uh, people that are now only referred to as you know, road signs or right. salets is yeah, not yeah. an English word. It's a native word. Right. It's, Right. So. Yeah, a little uh, touch on that a little bit. There really isn't a Siletz Indian. It, it, it's, uh, it's the town of Siletz is why they call them the Confederated Tribes of Siletz. That's where the reservation is at. And so that's how they became to know that. Uh, I, I, and, and again, I'm not quite sure of all the facts, but I don't know if they were called the Siletz Tribe on the big reservation. I think they were still going by their, by their tribal names mm -hmm. and living in, in probably in clans. Uh, along the, the strip of reservation. You know, mm -hmm. I think it wasn't until they moved to the reservation, actually, uh, after all the land was uh, illegally taken away from them, yeah. that they uh, were called the Siletz Indian tribe. Okay. And they were confederated tribes of Siletz until uh, being disbanded in 1955, and they were ah, restored. they were terminated. Terminated, yep. Mm. Uh, along Let's with other talk tribes. about <laughs> termination. Okay. <laughs> um, because one of the things that happens, and I think the, the re part of the purpose of the show is really to talk about those differences in a way that, you know, right, you're legally the same as Germany, but we don't call Germans tribes. Right. So, wait, you're legally a nation, but you're a tribe. So there's that. So that's mm -hmm. why I try, you know, it's not about being poli politically correct. It's polite conversation. Let's recognize right. the reality. Mm -hmm. It's a nation, right? right? Yeah. right? And so we, even though we commonly use the terminology tribe, I mean, there's a subtle psychology in there, mm -hmm. like you're less civilized than, right. you know, us. Yeah. So clans, bands, What's the difference between a clan and a band, if there is one? Well, clans are a, a group within a band. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then the a band is is, is uh, um, probably uh, yes, like uh, uh, offshoot from a, the, the whole nation mm -hmm. <laughs> tribe. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And so you have you have bands that might be say uh, uh, the Cherokee tribe has uh, seven clans. Okay. And so a a, a band may be. Uh, an offshoot of one of the clans, or the clan offshoot of the band, and the band is a, a bigger group living in the one part of the reservation or tribal lands, or, mm -hmm. or prior to uh, President Andrew Jackson, maybe uh, in North Carolina or Georgia on their homelands. Um, so a band isn't what you'd be recognized as a complete tribe. Okay. The tribe is a large okay. conglomerate of all the bands and clans. So would it be accurate, and correct me if I'm wrong, please. Uh, so you have a native nation, right? and then bands are kind of like states there you go. within the band, yep. Yep. 
right? And then clans would be kind of like counties. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Thanks for being here tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, okay, but when we talk about clans, because it's important, because when I was talking about six nations, uh, right. well, actually maybe we haven't talked about six nations before, but in terms of democracy, like indigenous democracy. Mm -hmm. So the five nations of the Iroquois, which eventually became six, okay, the clan mothers, so it's ten animal clans, like snipe, deer, bear, right, right. whatever, you know, mm -hmm. ten of those, right? Select five chiefs, right? And to be a chief, you have to be either a blood relative of one of the clan mothers or a relative by marriage. Mm -hmm. So five nations, ten clans, and then you have ten, fifty representatives. Right? And so that's where you get the expansion of representative democracy that right. is essentially the model that Tommy Jeff, excuse me, <laughs> the <laughs> white founding fathers yeah. basically used to create the democracy here, except that they mm -hmm. didn't center it with women being at the center of the nation as it was with the Iroquois. So when you talk right. about seven clans of the Cherokee, right. wh who, who are those? Like, name a few of them. Well, uh, I, uh, my family comes from the Pink Clan okay. and, and the, the, uh, the Wolf Clan. Okay. And, and that's where Six Killer comes from. It's from, okay. from the Wolf Clan because of the, known as the Protectors. All right. Yeah. And then the, the Long Hair Clan and the, the and excuse me, I can't uh, come up with the rest of them right now. Just, uh, a friend the, of mine was lights, Nighthawk. But, yeah. Clan, the Kitawa band, or whatever, which yeah. he described well, it, as a secret society within. It was a secret society, yeah. and, and now the society still exists, and it is a, a whole different than the Cherokee Nation. It's a Kitawa tribe of Oklahoma, and okay. you have to be at least one quarter total blood quantum to be a member of the, uh, the Kitawa band. Uh, uh, so that there was the Cherokee tribe of the Kitawa and the Cherokee tribe of Oklahoma. Mm, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, we've mentioned termination, and so yes, I do have right. to come back and say that the Sledge tribe was restored in 1977, uh, and uh, was the like second tribe in the nation to, to have its sovereignty. So it, uh, uh, it was pretty important at the time. Uh, and I, I try to teach the kids coming through the education program to never lose that that fact that the people that went back to Washington D.C. to lobby for the Sledge people to become a uh, a, a nation again of indigenous peoples they didn't do that without education mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. even though uh, maybe we're being taught wrong in some aspects of, of our, our history and uh, you can other you can gain other things through education uh, how to lobby for your people how to stand up in front of yeah. uh, people and, and, and make your point as efficiently as you can uh, and uh, to be able to have the education and, and the knowledge and I always like to broadcast that there's power and knowledge. Yes. And so once you have that, you can go to these lo lobby tables and, and talk to the people and get your point across and help your people. And you know, the, the several people that, uh, that went to Washington, D.C. on many excursions to uh, bring back the Sluts tribe, uh, uh, I'd like to bring that up to our students, our young people coming up, and I show them pictures of these people sitting at the table in front of the Senate committee and, and, and bringing their tribe back. And so there's a, a, an incentive and a goal to get become educated and help your tribe as any way you can. And so, so they put together, they meaning say what we refer to as the dominant culture. Okay, put together this confederation for a period of time and then decide you're right. terminated. You're you're Americans now. Right. Yeah. The Eisenhower well, administration. Yeah. The Eisenhower administration. Yeah, I like Ike. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so what was that about? You're supposed to become Americans now, or? W well, uh, I'm assuming that's what the, uh, of course, there was the, the Assimilation Act. Yes. You know, uh, and we call that the Termination Act yes. also. Um, I get off the trail a little bit here, but my uh, grandfather. It's still part of the trail, actually. Yeah, yeah and how I uh, uh, became an Oregonian <laughs> from, from being a, an Okie. Uh, was uh, my grandfather was actually was uh, uh, part of that assimilation act and has moved out to from uh, from Westville, Oklahoma, out to Portland area, hmm. and uh, to they uh, located some housing for him and a job and 
And he, he wound up in a little town uh, just north of Portland called St. Helens. Mm. And okay. uh, worked out there and, and decided that uh, he was there for a while and decided he couldn't take it anymore. And had some relatives out here too. And, I mean, I can't remember now if they moved out with him or not. But anyway, he went back home to Oklahoma and uh, then uh, moved, I guess, because of uh, there was so much uh, uh, racism going on down there that he moved up away from everybody and worked in the oil fields up in Kansas. Okay. Uh, but then uh, my mom comes along and the, they have relatives in Oregon still. And so they come out here to Oregon to visit relatives. Well, my mom happens to meet this guy who was on vacation or or, or um, had to come on a trip from Oklahoma to Oregon and they met in a hospital room <laughs> with my dad eventually and so he, they all had relatives out here so they okay. uh, yeah, so this is uh, this is why I'm in Oregon so. okay. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, getting back to the, uh, the, the Termination Act with uh, Eisenhower I, I think that was part of that they wanted the uh, the uh, these uh, smaller bands um, of natives to become Americanized, mm -hmm. and so disbanding them or terminating was a way to do that. Uh, become Americans mm -hmm. and forget about who you are as, a, as an Indian. Melt uh, into the melting pot. There you go. Something yeah. like that. Yeah, that's right. Except some so, people don't melt too well. Well, <laughs> I like to think of, of it as a tossed salad, you know, yeah. a melting pot, because uh, it's like John Trudell would say in that movie he was in, uh, you can't break our spirit. Yeah. And. Uh, and I'd like to instill in our kids uh, any amount of American Indian blood that you have, worship it and take it to the end and, and be proud of who you are uh, before they take it all away from us. Mm -hmm. um, our, I think our nations are becoming stronger now throughout the, uh, on Turtle Island, throughout this, uh, not just uh, America, but Canada and Mexico, and people are realizing again who they are. And, and, uh, uh, and you, you can never... Um, tell people what to do or what to say uh, so you just have to follow your heart as far as relationships go but yeah. but uh, uh, I think our tribes and, and the nations are becoming stronger so. so there is kind of a mixed so when you said Celets was the second nation to get be recognized again who was the first uh, a tribe and I was just thinking I know you're gonna ask me that question uh, um, I I want to say uh, uh, Ojibwe, okay. uh, but I know, and I know it's a northern tribe. And, okay. I, and I just talked to a man in Seattle, uh, up there for an education conference, and and he was saying that he felt good that he was the first nation. Mm. And I believe he said Ojibwe. Mm. I, I, again, just uh, the bright lights. <laughs> well, <laughs> so so yeah. I, I don't want to sit here and sound unintelligent, but uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, you're doing uh, fine. You're but doing uh, fine. anyway. So uh, the, the uh, I guess a, another question I could ask is in terms of looking at recognition. There's a whole politic around that. So there's federal recognition and then there's state recognition. Some tribes or nations have both right. and some have only state and not, like you said, there's nine fairly recognized tribes, but right. that's in Oregon, mm -hmm. but that's not the only, that doesn't, that's not to say that there are only nine different tribes of Indians in Oregon now. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, of course, I don't know how many hundreds of tribes uh, uh, there were, you know, originally uh, before uh, Oregon became a state, uh, or be before they come fully recognized and, and put together by the federal government. Uh, what fully recognized means that the federal government recognizes this group, the Sluts, the Confederated Tribes of Sluts, Grand Ron, Cow Creek, uh, Coquel. Coos, Klamath, uh, Umatilla, Warm Springs, uh, recognizes them and, or, and Burns Paiute mm -hmm. uh, as federally recognized tribes. Uh, um, how they come about that, I'm not positive about, but I do know you have to be federally recognized to receive any uh, subsistence from the federal government. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of other things that go along with being federally recognized also, uh, education, uh, statewide or, or, or federal-wide education through the FAFSA um, or any kind of federal aid toward, for schools. Um, but to, to become fairly recognized, you have to have and, and you have to apply and you have to have enough members in your tribe to be able to run the government and yeah. social services, education, 
um, okay. all of the politics involved in there is try there is politics involved because even yes. if you do have the numbers that doesn't necessarily guarantee successful recognition exactly right um, there, now there are state recognized tribes yeah. uh, um, the state will recognize I guess within the state they can receive some uh, funding or or some um, advantages through the state uh, uh, for federally recognized tribes for most things that we do as a federally recognized tribe for instance uh, uh, for our powwowers or, or, or spiritual people that like uh, eagle feathers to, and then some need eagle feathers for for their spirituality and uh, ceremonies and things. You, to get one, you, uh, even as an American Indian, you have to order it through the federal government and you have to be an enrolled member of a federally recognized tribe to receive one. Mm. And most of our tribes uh, had what we would call, I suppose, eagle hunters, uh, would, uh, where their sole responsibility was to uh, hunt eagles for ceremony. Uh, depending on what the ceremony may be. Uh, they don't allow us to do that anymore. Mm. And, uh, although I'm sure there's some rebels out there. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. But, uh, but with, to, to legally we have to order eagle feathers through the federal government, through a uh, repository around Denver, Colorado. Mm. And we have to put orders for them. And, and they come to us as a, a dead bird, a frozen bird. And then it's up to us to uh, uh, take the feathers that we want. But, uh, uh, but you have to be a federally recognized Indian person. You never person. knew that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. You have to order Order them. your eagle feathers. Okay. Right. Yeah. right. So I know a different mm. concept, huh? <laughs> 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 and it used to be that way with uh, any, uh, any raptor. It's against the law uh, for anybody to have a raptor feather, except for American Indians. Uh, to, uh, and it's been that way for well, I would say 30, 35 years now. It used to be anybody could to uh, could pick up eagle feathers or or have eagles, um, but now you have to be uh, have a proper permit to yeah. to have eagle feathers. Proper permit. Yes. And they can be they can be handed down through the family. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and you can be given them or whatever. But uh, actually, no. Like the rules you stated, you have to be an enrolled member, et cetera, et cetera, even right. possess one. To be assessed one, yeah. right. right. So as a radio host of a Native show, uh, what do you see as your primary role as a Native person promoting Native culture in the media? Yeah, that's a good question, too. And it's, uh, I guess that's a passion. Maybe I can talk about the yeah. radio a little more yeah. <laughs> coherently. <laughs> but uh, I, I uh, have a radio program on 91.9 uh, KRVM. It's every Thursday night from 7 to 9, and uh, I broadcast the uh, powwow, contemporary, and traditional style music uh, with emphasis on powwow. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's dear and near to my heart. It, it, uh, powwow because it brings all the, the many nations together at one place. And um, In fact, we, have, we represent about 85 tribes just around uh, the Eugene Springfield area. Okay. So we have lots of people coming together at a powwow site. So I, I like to play a lot of powwow. And, and uh, the first hour of my show, uh, it's only a two hour show on Thursdays, but the first hour I, uh, I try to play a lot of contemporary. And to me, it brings out uh, uh, native talent. Mm. Uh, uh, Do you some ever people play War Party? No, I never have played War Party. There, there are these uh, they're rappers from, uh, I think they're Ojibwe, mm -hmm. somewhere in you know, one of the things is called the greatest natives of the north, right? So right. they actually start off with this whole kind of Indian-esque prayer right. you know, before going on to this rap. Yeah, you know, scratches and yeah. stuff like that. Right, so, yeah. And it's like, wow, Indian rappers, okay. <laughs> no, I, didn't, I don't yeah. get a lot of call for uh, Indian rap. I don't play a lot of uh, rock and roll native style. Uh, okay. Although I do have a, a fine collection of uh, indigenous and, and other rock and roll groups. Yeah. I, I don't get a lot of call for uh, for that type of music. I try to play more uh, uh, maybe what you would call uh, protest music mm -hmm. or the flute style, more easy listening flute style, a lot of flutists out there. And, and uh, all the time I've been on there, I'm going on my uh, 13th year at KRVM oh. okay. with Indian time. And I still haven't scratched the surface uh, mm. of all the music that's out there. Um, so I try to play a variety of music. Uh, like last week I had a special on John Tradell. Okay. And it was so well received, I'm gonna do it again tomorrow night. Uh, have more John Tradale on there. 
uh, and then and, and, and other people intermittently. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, but I try to, to bring to light uh, the talent that American Indians have in modern day, plus go back back in the day and play some traditional style music to see the difference of where we've come from and where we're at today and uh, the talents that we've, we've gained through, uh, through our travel through the uh, modern world. Yes, and our, ex so. our exposure to Western civilization. Exactly, right. So, um, it, through the medium of radio, I mean, the portrayals of Native people on, in the media are not always all that positive. They're kind of like stereotypical. Right. Um, yeah. And you know when you so certainly there's you know requested music like powwow and flute mm -hmm. style and and other things like that. Um, how do you feel that portrays in, in portrays us in the best light? Uh, well, uh, one of my uh, reasons for being on the radio, not just because it, uh, I can play the music and, uh, and it's part of the Oregon, which we've never had before. Mm -hmm. yeah. KRVM allowed us to come on the air. Right. Um, and let you run for 14 years. So. Yeah, exactly. And I'm proud to say that I am the host and producer of the show, yeah. so I don't have anybody telling me what music I can play or can't yeah. play. And I try to relate to the people, uh, and I don't so much anymore as when I first started with talking about stereotypes mm -hmm. and our, our music. And uh, because the first years I was on there, uh, Everybody was new listeners mm -hmm. and tuning in to see what kind of music I would play. So I would I would talk a little bit about stereotypes and mm -hmm. and uh, things that Hollywood gave us the the the, uh, the stereotypical drum beat uh, you know the uh, <laughs> yeah I always like to, to tease and say well it was the first bear song I ever learned or the first uh, <laughs> beer song I ever learned was uh, was that drum beat. Uh, and then uh, other, other stereotypes about American Indians, I like to dispel that a lot, which uh, again, I don't do so much now. I used to pretty much play the music now, but the first years I was on there, I, I talked about that a lot. Mm. Uh, I think it's a good vehicle to uh, let non-Indian people know who we are as American Indians, because I do have a large audience of non-Indian people that, that, uh, that listen and uh, let them know who we are and, and this is our music. And, and it's not what you think it is from watching the, the movies in the, back in, the, especially the 50s and 60s. And, right. you know, the, uh, the Indians are beating up on the, the ranchers and, and pretty soon it, uh, here comes the cavalry with John Wayne wiping everybody <laughs> out and, and wondering why uh, it's a great battle for them. And, and if we, it's the other way around, it's a massacre. So, you know, <laughs> you got to think right, about those things. Right. <laughs> yes. But, uh, and, uh, you know, then the war hoop and, and all that and, and let people know that that's not who we are. And, and uh, just, we're just human beings and trying to make it through this and, and not a cartoon character on a baseball hat. And, yeah. You know, and don't get me started on mascots. Cause <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, then that brings us right back to education then because, exactly. you know, when I talk about, or when, you know, we've referred to a weaponized educational system. So, you know, and you're like an education specialist for Celets, um how do you educate youth, or how does the Celeste Nation, Tribe, Confederation educate their youth for success, whatever success means? Maybe even success is kind of even a Western concept. Right. I, um, success, yeah, that, that's, that's interesting. Uh, I guess success to an a Indian person uh, is, is become knowledgeable and, and uh, educated in a way of, of the Western civilization so they can live in this lifestyle but maintain their heritage and culture also. Without uh, being destroyed by it. Without being destroyed by it, yeah. exactly. But being able, uh, being educated enough to stay on top of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately that uh, is pretty much what we have to do uh, to, to keep us, our identities, yeah. know who we are. Yeah. Is to, uh, I don't like to say living on both sides of the fence I like to say I'm walking on that fence, but I'm leaning towards my American Indian side. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, but so I, I, I don't, so I couldn't say preach to my kids that come to me, because uh, I do uh, education in four phases. I, I do a, a program that's called the Johnson O'Malley program, okay. which is from K through 12. And, and that is opened up to uh, all native peoples uh, that can document who they are. They have to be federally recognized 
or be able to prove there at least one quarter total Indian blood okay. to begin the Johnston O'Malley program. Okay. And that's with all tribes. Yeah. And then, the, then my other program is adult education. And, and anything after 12th grade is for select tribal people only. And I, I do an adult education program, which is for uh, American or for select tribes. It maybe need some training for their job ability to enhance uh, their, uh, their job. Or maybe they haven't had the chance to get a GED high school diploma. I can help fund that for them. Uh, or if they're uh, uh, illiterate or, or or slightly illiterate, I can. Uh, is, that, is that a correct term? That slightly? is correct. <laughs> yeah. right. Illiterate and, I, and enumerate. Yeah, they yeah, can't yeah. read or they can't compute with right. numbers. Yeah. And I help them with uh, any class that they need to, uh, to start them on a the road to. Uh, becoming literate again and be able to uh, make their way. Um, and then I have a, a adult vocational training program that I run. It's, a, it's based on a two-year associate's degree, but also we can do things, uh, a one-year certificate. I have uh, several students out here at Lane through the Select Tribe. Um, and then uh, any training program in between that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so there's a just a ton of things I can do to as a training program yeah and they and in fact uh, some of the kids have up to three years uh, for a uh, dental hygiene program or the uh, nursing program uh, three consecutive years for that program that uh, we will fund for them and uh, then I have higher education of course which is a uh, bachelor's degree uh, four year and I have several students here at Lane doing that on the Oregon transfer degree program um, and so the Celeste tribe will pay no less than their books and tuition. Mm -hmm. That's always paid for. Mm -hmm. uh, so the kids uh, coming out of school, uh, once uh, uh, they graduate high school and and move on to, to higher ed, and, and so I try to instill upon them uh, the education that they're going to need not only to make it in this Western civilization and a dominant society, but to come back and lobby for their tribe or work yeah. for their tribe, yeah. bring their education back home. and. Uh, we all have our different trails and, and, and goals and, and uh, ideas that we want to pursue and dreams. Uh, but I try to encourage them to come home uh, for a little bit, bring their education back to their people and, and help out their people. And then if you want to expand on that and, and, uh, and follow your own trail. But, uh, but uh, the Sludge Tribe and the tribes around Oregon pay a lot of money for their kids to become educated. And I'd like to uh, say that uh, uh, when I first came to work for Solettes, uh, there weren't a whole lot of people getting bachelor's degrees. And, but now uh, we've, we've, uh, we've uh, changed that. Kids are staying in school longer. And at the time, we didn't have a problem funding our kids for master's and wanted to go on to get a master's degree. And now we're having trouble funding. We have so many kids doing that that we're having trouble funding the funding well, for that. Well, that's a nice yeah. problem. Yeah, that is a good problem. And, uh, and we're working on that. So uh, we do have incentive programs also for kids that do uh, finish high school. Or each each uh, phase of graduation, we have incentives for our kids, uh, so that we give that for them to look forward to upon completion of any uh, any education program. Mm. Um, so we like to uh, uh, talk to them about what it's like to be an Indian in in this world and and in, in this uh, different world that we live in now than our ancestors did and to maintain their culture and, and heritage through education. And, and, and we do have some big uh, education uh, conferences at uh, NIEA, for one, at the National Indian Education Association that's held every year in different cities uh, that really work hard towards justice for American Indians in education. So I'm, I'm proud to say that I work in education and watching my kids grow from kindergarten and graduating from college, and, hey, uh, that's good. And I've seen that. Yeah. You know, maybe not kindergarten, but you know, through elementary, through. Well, certainly we're yeah. old enough and long in tooth so that we can have a, we can ad actually yeah. admit to observing yeah. that. Oh yeah, <laughs> and it's a good feeling. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. I don't I don't know a better feeling than, than to see that. Yeah. And especially kids that uh, first start out, they don't have the self esteem or the confidence to do it, and watch them blossom as they gain confidence in themselves through education and. And uh, I'm proud to say also a lot of the kids have come back and, and, and now have jobs for the working with the tribe. Mm. Uh, the Sluts tribe uh, has about, I want to say, 270 employees. Mm. And we have an administration office on, on a reservation in Sluts. Uh, and then we have an area office in Portland. 
and Salem and Eugene, with actually Salem having and serving probably the most tribal members Hmm. Uh, because in the 50s, again, during the Termination Act, uh, most of the tribal people moved off of the Salutes Reservation over to uh, the valley. So. Um, I would give you a caution, <coughs> only because you're a nation that has a casino. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some work that I, I did for, um, for Pequot which uh, also, you know, even though, uh, especially con it's controversial with native casinos, especially in this state, you know, especially with, you know, the new one, a relatively new one going up in Florence and all that kind of stuff. Right. All native casinos put together, I read the statistic in the New York Times, so it must be true, right? <laughs> okay. So the annual income of all native casinos put together in America is ten billion dollars. Just ten mm. billion dollars. Yes. Okay? <laughs> okay. Which is nothing, really, compared yeah. to yeah. lots of different industries around. Certainly less mm -hmm. I mean the alcohol industry spends ten billion dollars on advertising alone. Exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> right. Yeah. I yeah, I can't uh, I don't know I don't know the exact number, so yeah. I, I don't I don't know yes or no. But you know, the the point being yeah. so you know uh, I, I, I understand that, right. The idea yeah. is that the, you know, in order to have a casino you actually have to give up part of your sovereignty and make mm -hmm. a compact with the governor to even have a casino. So you actually have to right. trade away your nation to nation status to actually make a compact with a state governor, right? Well, uh, uh, partially true. Uh, I know that we, uh, not we, here I go again, thinking yeah. I'm Salettes, but, yeah. but uh, the, I know the casinos have to pay a 10%, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's 10% right. of their, of their uh, income uh, to the state for certain gambling, uh, such as craps tables or poker. Mm -hmm. I, now, I don't know if they just have strictly slots if they would have to or not, yeah. but they do, uh, Anyway, it's pay well and above what they need to pay the state. Uh, I know that uh, the Sleds Tribe has the uh, Chinook Winds Casino up in Lincoln City, uh, and that town is, is the biggest employer of, the, of that town, mm -hmm. and that whole strip mm -hmm. of little cities that go along there. Mm -hmm. And then they're very proud to have our casino, or mm -hmm. the Sleds Casino in, in uh, Lincoln City. Especially, you know, if it does, you know, become an engine of the economy. Right. right. So, yeah. though the, Part of that deck of cards, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. When you're handed the casino, is the joker of the sovereignty piece, and also that well, they might eventually try and take that away, right? One way mm -hmm. or the other. Mm -hmm. So I guess this leads to the last question, you know, in terms of you know what it means to be native in the 21st century, and looking at shifting the model uh, of okay, what you do with the frog skins, that is, mm -hmm. the dollar bills, right? right? Mm -hmm. And what if we treated those frog skins as if they were eagle feathers, not, not doled out by the government? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. idea of there's, a, there's medicine in these, and it isn't your medicine, it's the seventh generation's medicine, so it doesn't go up your nose or into your bottle, right. into the bottle, yeah. it's an investment, mm -hmm. and investment in education, you know, or, or something like that. You're spending mm -hmm. it, not f spending it, but investing it in the future so that you have this kind of relationship with the land, and so that's preserved, and the casino becomes the vehicle for spawning off other businesses and other forms of solidity so that we're more viable beyond right. when, when they take that away because mm -hmm. they gone. Right. They gone try. Yeah. History has yeah. te taught us that, mm -hmm. right? So when right. we get those weapons, you know, to be educated, to understand, uh, you know, what we need to do to remain viable in terms of, you know, the laws and mm -hmm. other practices. So what does it mean to be native in the 21st century? Um, always remembering who you are. Mm. Uh, we, we dress just like everybody else does, you know, uh, we get up in the mornings out of our nice comfy mattress, we slip on our shoes, we, we uh, eat dinner, breakfast, lunch at the dinner table, we, we jump in our vehicles and drive to work. But inside, we know who we are. Mm. 
uh, I don't think we ever lose that spirit uh, of our ancestors of so many years ago. Uh, 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 myself, I think of uh, my, my grandpa, my great grandpa and grandma and what they went through, that we can still be here. There's the, the trials and tribulations, the, the battles that they must have fought to, for survival, yeah. just the survival of the peoples. Yeah. Um, for us to be in the 21st century, which they really didn't even give it a thought to, really. Right, we were uh, supposed to be extinct by now. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. And so for them to, to it's all great Indian nations, uh, uh, so many nations within one nation, uh, what, what we call the United States, that made so much Turtle Island. In the 21st century, uh, uh, to be Indian now, it, it, uh, I think I'm just as proud now to be an American Indian as our ancestors were when they were struggling to, to be who they were, knowing who they were and not losing that spirit. And always give thanks for that. And uh, I always try to instill that upon my kids also. My kids, all my students, uh, yeah. I always refer to them as my kids. Well, it is part uh, of that village that, to raise those children. So I want to thank you for coming. My pleasure. You're, you're a great host, and I've known you for quite a while, and, and it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. And, it's and, a pleasure uh, and honor to have you. Yeah, thank you. If you've liked what you've seen tonight, um, email us at liveclass uh, at lanecc, put diversity TV in the subject line, and tell a friend about it and tune in uh, at uh, Wednesday nights, 6 p.m., and uh, we, during either spring break or winter break, we also run Diversa TV marathons on this channel. And uh, we're always glad to hear new suggestions for new shows and future topics. So as always, go well, stay well. <laughs>